Good evening, everyone. Hi again. This is not Sister Alice. <laughs> this is Jasmine, and I'm really happy to be here with each and every one of you. I hope that we get um, a great viewing and outcome of people that will be joining us this evening uh, for Real Talk. Uh, Pastor Alice is unfortunately unavailable, and so she's called me and for some of you that have had the chance to um, join me in previous Real Talks, when she's called me uh, to back her up, you know what she says, uh, Jazz, you've got to be ready in season and out of season, just like the Bible says. And so here I am uh, this evening filling in for Pastor Alice, and um, I hope that we can, you know, share in this discussion together about what the Bible says about foolishness. I know it's an interesting and intriguing topic, but you can be assured that we're going to discover what the Bible says about this specific topic, and I pray that this evening we'll be able to come out of it with a better perspective of how not to walk in foolishness as the Bible describes it, but be people who are led and filled with the wisdom of God. Uh, for some of you that are joining us tonight, my name's Jasmine. I am Pastor Alice's daughter, and unfortunately, she's unable to be here this evening, but I'm here, and um, I know that more than anything, the Lord is here with us. And so without further ado, let us come together and let's acknowledge um, who we're here to meet with this evening. And you're not here to meet with me. Um, I am just a mere instrument, a, a vessel, a messenger of the Word of God tonight, and we want to hear from the Lord this evening. And for those of you that are tuning in, I see the numbers increasing. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for Skyways Real Talk. We're going to be going into, this, into the scriptures and finding out what the Bible says about foolishness. And I'm continuing in Pastor Alice's series on wisdom. And now we're tackling that offside of wisdom, which is foolishness. So let's get into prayer. Let's prepare our spirit. And we're going to um, just prepare our heart in worship uh, before we get into the word. So please join me as we, as, as we pray tonight. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We praise you. Lord, we acknowledge that you are the source of all wisdom. Lord, we don't have it all together and we don't claim to have it all together. Lord, but we thank you that um, when we put our faith in your son, Jesus Christ, we receive uh, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us who leads us into all truth. Tonight, we welcome you, God, to speak to us, to minister to us. Yes, God, open our eyes. Lord, open our ears, open our mind, Lord, so that we may know how to live a life of wisdom and depart from any form of foolishness as you describe it in your word. Lord, we pray, Father, for every heart and every person that's joining us tonight. Lord, may they experience your presence. Lord, even in, in, in their homes this evening and wherever they're joining us tonight, God, Lord, may they feel your love. May they know that you are real. We thank you, we thank you, and we praise you, Lord Jesus. We give you all the glory and all the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we are going to uh, sing this first song by, Brook by the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir, and it's called Jesus Is. Praise the Lord. Everybody glad you serve a God who's more than enough? Amen? Come on, if he's your everything, I need you to clap your hands. Let's sing and celebrate Jesus in this place. From the storm, he's all my heart is longing for. The one that I adore, Jesus is. Burdens he would bear. 
come close Nothing can compare You're our living hopeless Jesus Your presence Lord I've tasted and seen Of the sweetest of love when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone Your presence, Lord Oh Holy Spirit, You are welcome here Come flood this place and fill the end your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, oh, Lord, your presence, Lord, let us become more aware of your presence, let us experience the glory of your goodness, let us become more aware of your presence, let us experience, oh let us become Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience. Thank you to those of you that are joining us tonight. I pray that you were blessed in that time of worship. And I know that the Holy Spirit is honored and he is pleased when we come together in unity. Just want to make a quick shout out here. Um, trying to trying to maneuver here, but I believe I can see uh, Tita Nitz and Nino Noli and Nina Adele, Brother Mitha. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm just not sure how this whole thing operates so I can see everyone uh, who's here. But uh, Rose, thank you. And Ninang Chat, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, please help me in, in praying for what we will be discussing this evening. Um, Sister Alice is currently unavailable to join us tonight for Real Talk. And so she's called on me to come in on her behalf and uh, just to share what God has put on her heart. And so in obedience uh, to that, I am here with you all this evening. And so I'm just uh, fixing up my setup here with my, uh, my notes. And so for those of you that are joining us this evening, we're going to be carrying on in um, the series that Sister Alice has been teaching now for the past few weeks. And I know that she's been uh, tackling uh, specifically the book of Proverbs and the topic of wisdom. And so tonight we're going to be um, learning from the Word of God on the opposite of walking in wisdom. And we're going to be discovering what the Bible says um, about foolishness. And so let's get right into the Word right now. Um, 
some of us may be wondering what the Bible says about foolishness. And for those of you that, that read the Proverbs on, on a daily basis, there's, there's quite a lot that the Bible says about foolishness. And it may sound harsh uh, to describe um, ourselves, you know, at times walking in foolishness, um, thinking thoughts that are foolish, or maybe even describing someone or a situation as foolish. However, it is um, quite an unfortunate state, and we don't want to be people who walk in foolishness. Um, right now, if you have your Bibles, we can quickly go to Psalms uh, 14, verses 1. And it says there that only fools say in their hearts that there is no God. Wow. That's in Psalms 14.1. Um, again, in, in, in Proverbs 12, verses 15 through 16. If you have your Bibles, you can join along there. We're just going to be unfolding a few scriptures here. Um, it says here, fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. A fool is quick-tempered, but a wise person stays calm when insulted. I I don't know if I've actually um, followed through well uh, when being insulted and keeping calm, but now reading this and having this great refresher, I don't want to be looked upon as foolish um, by demonstrating a quick temper. But I want to be considered wise because I've stayed calm when insulted. And we certainly don't want to think that our way is always right. We want to listen to wise counsel from others. Let's tackle another scripture here. In Proverbs 29 verse 11. Wow, I am so guilty of this as well. Here we go. It says, fools vent their anger. But the wise quietly hold it back. Again, Proverbs 29 verse 11 says, Fools vent their anger, but the wise quietly hold it back. Lord Jesus, help us to be people who are filled with wisdom. And let us not be people who are foolish. So um, the first point here that I'd like to, to, to bring out this evening um, is, is a rather important one. And I'm just fixing up my notes here. So I'd like to talk about this first mention. And it's quite important, again, in Psalms 14, verse 1. Here is a common trait that we need to pay attention to, especially in these last days. The fool is someone who doesn't regard God. And this is taken right out of scripture in Psalms 14, verse 1. And I'll read it again. It says, only fools say in their hearts that there is no God. You know, we, we believe as Christians that we are created in the image of God and the scriptures support that because in the book of Genesis, we hear there the plan of the Trinity saying, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let us give him dominion over all the earth, over every beast and over every living thing. And so we know that our God he is the divine creator. He is the divine orchestrator. He is the divine architect of everything that we see around us and everything that was from the very beginning of time. And so for us, you know, even in, in our darkest moments to say, you know, there is no God with all this hardship that I'm going through. Let us not become that kind of person who is so quick to declare those words of absolute judgment and certainty that there is no God when we're going through a hard time or that there is no God when we feel like we have it all under control. My dear friends, the Bible says that in him, in Jesus Christ, we live, we move, and we have our being. You and I are created in the image of God. And so for us, to hold this false belief that there is no God, 
even in the midst of hardship and even in the midst of all the things that we see around us, the beauty and even the disorder. Let us not fall quick to make that absolute judgment because we know that once our life is through, we no longer have control of our eternal destination. And that causes me to tremble in fear. You know, I heard a, a pastor, and I'm reminded of this illustration right now. And he said that the closest thing to experiencing death while we are alive here on earth is when we are asleep. And when I heard that illustration from him, it made me take a step back and process that illustration. And it is true that while we are asleep, our body just falls into a sense, it, it, into a state, right? Where we are almost just shut off temporarily. It's an opportunity for our body physically and even on a cellular level to rejuvenate and to rest and to restore and to replenish itself. But as soon as we fall asleep, I have no better words to describe it. I'm not a scientist, but please, if anyone watching here is, is able to describe this in, in better scientific lingo, then you can help me out here. But you know that as soon as, as, as you fall asleep, you, you don't hear your children crying. You're, you're not able to discern what's happening next to you. It, it, it actually made me wonder that, oh my goodness, that is quite true. And so the same is true that when our life here is over, we do not have control anymore of our eternal destination. And so it is a wise thing for us to hold on to even the little bit of faith and belief that we have in Jesus Christ. We certainly cannot give an answer to every single question that we have about what's happening in this world around us. But I can tell you, my dear friends, that our God is in control, that our God holds the future, that we are handcrafted by Almighty God, and the Bible is certain and it is sure when it says that he will perfect his plan for us. And so again, Psalms 14, 1 says, the fools says in his heart that there is no God. Do you all remember that, um, that story of the rich fool in Luke chapter 12, um, where he um, thought he had everything and he looked down upon, you know, poor old Lazarus who was by the gate. And that evening he died. And so when he went into the bottomless pit in Abraham's bosom, he um, was crying out for help. And he felt the heat. He felt the thirst. He felt the deprivation of life. And he was begging. He was begging for rescue, for even a drop of water, right, to soothe his tongue. And, and, and God had told him, you know, while you were living, you did not even pay attention to poor old Lazarus. You did not even consider him. But that night, as he was there, he was begging the Lord for help and for rescue to save and, and, to, and to go out and to minister to his families who were still alive. And God said to him, you know what? They have the book of the prophets and they have my teachers and they have my servants while they are there living to listen and to hear from. But he was saying, no, no, no. If someone comes up from the dead, right, they will surely believe. But how much more? right? While, while they're alive, are they not able to receive the words of God? And that's the state that you and I are in right now. We are alive. We are living. We are breathing. We have this moment here and now to hear the words of God. So let us not be like that rich old fool, but Lazarus, if you read the end of that, of, of that story in the Bible, he found comfort and he found rest because he lived for the Lord. He put his faith in Christ, even though he was poor, right? Physically, 
He was poor in the eyes of society, but yet he did not demonstrate the pride that 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 rich uh, that, that this rich fool um, demonstrated while he was alive. That there is no God, and so we hear that um, in the Bible, right? We talked about it in Psalms fourteen one. We talked about it in in Proverbs twelve fifteen that fools think their own way is right. But here, Proverbs 28, verse 26, it also says here that those who trust in their own insight are foolish, but anyone who walks in wisdom is safe. Now, in, in, in the story of the rich fool, the source um, of his wisdom and the source of his own righteousness um, was from within himself. He worked for his money and he did everything that was right in his own eyes, but he did not want to listen to anyone who would give him advice, not even the prophets and not even the teachers. So let's examine the three defining characteristics of the fool from this story. He said, I believe I am the sole owner of my life. And what does scripture say about that? Proverbs 14 verse 12 says, there is a way that appears right to a man, but the end of it leads to death. So if we don't consult God first before making our decisions or setting our goals, we are acting like a fool. Second illustration from the rich, from the rich man in the book of, of Luke chapter 12. He believed that my material riches will make me safe and secure. He put all of his earthly energy into gaining earthly wealth. You know, as a Christian, our mindset should be that of stewardship. And what does that mean? God, everything that I have is yours. And everything that I will acquire, I'm going to use it for your glory. I'm going to be a resource, a channel of blessing. And this rich man, we can see in scriptures in Luke chapter 12 that he did not be he did not become an extension of God's blessing but rather again he amassed all of this wealth for himself but look what the bible says in John chapter 3 verse 27 it says here that no one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven another scripture in 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 17 says Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, who richly gives us all that we need for our enjoyment. I love the teaching of, um, of oh, let me see if I can get this right. I believe it's, it's um, John Bevere. And he's, he has a teaching entitled Driven by Eternity. And if you haven't seen that, um, you can watch a few of the videos on YouTube. And it's such an urgent plea, a great reminder of where our focus should be as Christians living in this physical world. We should be driven with an internal perspective. And I know that, that many of you who are committed and consistent viewers of Real Talk have heard Sister Alice talk about this, that we should live our lives with an eternal perspective. My dear friends, our life here on earth is but for a moment. Our life here on earth is short. It is fleeting. It is brief. At one moment, we are like flowers of the field, and then in an instant, we can be chopped and whisked away by the wind. And so when we live with an eternal perspective, when we are driven by eternity, we know that here on earth, we are just stewards. We are managers of God's blessings upon us. So we are blessed to be a blessing. We are blessed so that we can not only bless others and the kingdom of God, but it is teaching us the very heart of Christ. It is 
the heart of Christ to be generous, not only with our tangible and financial blessings, but that of our time. We are generous in lending our ear to, to be there of support for the brokenhearted. We are driven by eternity when we know that in our service to God, we are bringing with us the very eternal treasures that will never rot, it will never tarnish, it will never fade. And I learned this from Pastor Robert Morris. What are the eternal treasures that we will bring up with us to heaven? For those of you that, that, that know this teaching, you can say it out loud with me. It is the souls of people that we have led to the Lord. They are the very treasures that we will be bringing up with us to spend an eternity where there is no more weeping, there is no more sickness, there is no more confusion, there is no more rivalry, there is no more pain, because we have given them the greatest treasure of all, and that is the gospel and leading them into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so where does this go from my point here? Um, secondly, taken from, from, from the rich, uh, foolish man, um, that our material riches will make, oh, sorry, that's the third one. Um, actually, no, I'm sorry. That is the second one. The second characteristics of defining a fool uh, based on Luke chapter 12 is that my material riches will make me safe and secure. And so, no, contrary to that, as Christians, we live our life as stewards, managers of what God has given us, and we live with an eternal perspective. We are driven by eternity, knowing that the greatest thing that we can bring up with us to heaven is not our wealth. I don't know any person that has passed from death to life that was able to bring with them um, their eternal, uh, their their physical um, possessions. No, we know that that isn't true. So it is the souls, my dear friends, of, of the people that we have led to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, third characteristic of a fool taken from Luke chapter 12 in this story of the foolish rich man. He believed that he didn't have the time to pursue spiritual things. He used his time to accumulate temporal riches instead of eternal wealth. And as a result, he was a failure in the most important purpose of life, that is being rich towards God. Can we all take a step back and ask our and ask ourselves an important question? How how do we spend our time? You know, the average person, we go to work, we eat, we spend time, maybe a lot of time on social media. We try to a lot time to um, to hang with our friends and with our family and make it to special events. But how many of us actually carve out the time to spend with our creator? You know, the word of God, not only is it a source of wealth and knowledge and information, but it is the very breath of God that we are breathing when we pursue uh, making the priority of reading and, and meditating and understanding his word, um, a daily discipline in our life. And again, I'm drawing this illustration from, from Pastor Robert Morris, and I share this in the mentorship classes with, um, with our young worshipers on, on Saturday morning. Um, and I love this illustration from Pastor Robert Morris. And, and I saw in, in, in one of his preachings where he held out a Bible and he said, you know, when you open this book of the word of God, you are literally breathing in. You are literally ingesting and taking in the breath of God, the life of God. And, and that's the Hebrew word ruach, the breath of God, R-U-A-C-H. And so, my dear friends, may this serve as an encouragement because I know that maybe some of you have heard it in the beginning of, of, of Pastor Jim's uh, series um, when he started uh, preaching about the seven churches in the book of Revelation. He 
frequently admonishes me as well as my as well as my siblings and and those in our family and those of you that that join us every Sunday either online or for in person worship we need to make time for God it's not enough just to say okay i'm i'm going to read my daily devotion for today and that's about it no we need to make it a priority that we spend time in god's word and this is just one facet of pursuing spiritual things there's also prayer there's also worship there's also you know important aspect of witnessing and and also serving right in the body of christ what it looks like to pursue spiritual things. But this evening, I, I really would like to highlight the importance of God's word because the Bible gives enough emphasis in the book of Joshua, right? And in the book of Proverbs and in the book of Psalms. All right, I believe I lost connection there for a little bit. Welcome back to Real Talk. My name is Jasmine and I'm Pastor Alice's daughter and and um, where we left off was a third uh, characteristic of a foolishness taken from the rich, foolish uh, man from Luke chapter 12. And we were uh, discussing uh, the third characteristic, which was um, that this rich man did not have the time to pursue spiritual things. And so... Um, to continue on in what I was sharing about the importance of God's words to, um, hello, welcome back. It is me. I don't know how much of that was cut off or if you saw me trying to fix my connection here, I do apologize for that technical difficulty. And so I'm going to try to wrap up this point uh, before we lose connection again. All right. So for the second time, this is Jasmine. Um, uh, filling in for Pastor Alice on Real Talk. And we're just wrapping up the third characteristic taken from the story of the rich, foolish uh, man in Luke chapter 12. And just as a refresher, this was the man who looked down upon poor old Lazarus, who he saw begging for food. And, and um, you know, on a daily basis, he saw Lazarus in his in his very poor, humbled state outside of his gate. But then that evening, uh, the Lord said, you know, this this day, your life will be required of you. And so just to continue on in this in, in, in the story here, we can see that in this third characteristic taken from the rich, foolish man was that he didn't have time to pursue spiritual things. And so. Um, I, I I believe before we got interrupted, I was discussing one of the most important elements in pursuing spiritual uh, things that pleases God and that strengthens us is carving out time. Thank you, Athe Jocelyn, <laughs> um, to spend in God's word. And, you know, besides worship and besides prayer and, you know, daily communion and fellowship in being a part of the body of Christ and serving at a local church, um, you know, the giving of our resources, there's just a whole umbrella of, of ways that we can pursue spiritual things. But this evening, um, I just want to wrap up this, this one aspect of the word of God. And I was sharing with you from the illustration that I remembered from Pastor Robert Morris, that when we open the word of God, we are breathing in. We are literally like inhaling the breath of God. And so when we inhale the breath of God, we, and when we inhale that huwak, right? Hebrew word for the breath of God, R-U-A-C-H, we receive the life of God. And, and in, in the Greek, that's zoe, right? The life of God. And so it's going to change the way that we think. It's going to change the way that we speak. It's even going to change the way that we act 
And I want that because that is the fundamental ingredient for walking in wisdom is we fill our mind with the source of truth. We fill our mind with the source of all knowledge and that is Jesus Christ. And we have not been left clueless or mindless of how to tap into this wisdom that comes from God. We've been given the greatest the greatest tool and resource, and that is the very words of God. And so let me quickly um, run down to you some uh, general characteristics um, of foolishness. And so we've already um, explored the three characteristics of foolishness taken from the rich man in Luke chapter 12. And so I'm going to work from point three to point one. Number uh, number three is this rich man in Luke 12. He did not have the time to pursue spiritual things. He used all his time to accumulate temporary things instead of eternal wealth. So we talked about the importance of reading God's word. I asked, you know, myself and each one of you a question. How much do we spend right in pursuing a closer relationship with the lord how much do we how much of our time do we spend praying to god for a soul that we can evangelize to um and and those are just some very very short key elements there there's so much more to discover with that now second characteristic taken from the rich man the rich foolish man in luke 12 is he believed that his material riches would make him safe and secure and we know that there is absolutely no security in anything that this world can offer to us all of it is going to rot all of it is going to tarnish when we leave this world our assets will probably will most likely go to somebody else but in john chapter 3 verse 27 it says here that no one can receive anything unless god gives it from heaven and so as a christian right? Our mindset should be that of a steward, of a manager. God, please teach me how to manage the blessings, the resources that you've given to me, my time, my finances, God, even my children, my family, Lord. How can I be a manager that uses the things that you have entrusted to me for your glory, for its purpose, and for your purpose? So we, we ought to live with an eternal perspective. We ought to be driven by eternity. And number one, the first characteristic of this fool taken from Luke chapter 12 is that he was the sole owner of his life and possessions. He chose his own way. He chose to pursue his own goals, but he spent barely any time, maybe little to none, in seeking direction from God. And, you know, Proverbs 14, 12 says that there is a way that appears right to a man, but the end of it leads to death. So we need to consult God first. Um, and so let's quickly run down here before we wrap up Real Talk. Thank you for all of you that have tuned in this evening. Your support and your viewership this evening means so much. Um, so we're going to explore now um, the five characteristics just generally of a fool. First Corinthians uh, chapter 13, verse 11. I'm just taking out my notes here. First Corinthians 13, verse 11 says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. That scripture is self-explanatory. Um, and, and, and for so many of you that are joining us this evening that have raised up little kids, um, you know how imperative and important it is that we take every opportunity to teach our children not only how to be responsible uh, so that they're set up for success, when they're off on their own and having to make their own life decisions, um, but also to consult with the Lord and to truly grow in the fullness of God's word. 
And so here we are with the number one general characteristic of a foolish person. And so it says here that the foolish hate instruction. Proverbs 1 7 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 18 verse 2 says a fool has no delight in understanding, but only in revealing his own opinions. So the Bible shows us really, really quickly here that number one, the fools, they hate wisdom, they hate instruction, they hate knowledge, and they hate understanding. Second gen general characteristic of the foolish is the foolish are full of words. A fool is a constant talker, but little effort to listen to instruction or to even listen to others. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 3 says, A fool's voice is known by multitude of words. Ouch. Again, in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 14, a fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what will be and what will be after him. Who can tell? This is, this is a clear instruction for us that we shouldn't be so, so sure of the things that we're saying, right? The, the, the only way that we can be solidly sure that what we're saying is correct is, is when we are directly taking it from the word of God. Our own words, our own opinions, our own thoughts hold no weight, hold no authority except to that when it is from the word of God. Look at this, Proverbs 14, verse 3. A rod of pride is in the mouth of a fool, but the lips of the wise shall keep them. One last verse in Proverbs for the second point. Proverbs 15, verse 2. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge, but the mouth of fools pours out foolishness. This babbling, right? I, I think we can call it that. This babbling characteristic of a fool is really a demonstration of pride. And so, you know, I'm, I'm even taking this as, you know, uh, uh, an admonition to myself. Again, the Bible says it is better to be slow to speak, but quick to listen. And I remember um, hearing this from, from a teaching. And, and right now, I actually cannot recall uh, which pastor I heard it from, but now that I'm recalling it, it's, it's making me quite embarrassed because I know that I'm guilty of it. And the illustration goes to the effect of when we are so quick to interrupt others, um, it actually shows that we don't value um, their opinion or what they have to say and that our opinion is far more important um, than actually listening and allowing them, giving that privilege and giving them that right to finish what they have to say. So God, forgive me. God, forgive us. Because I know I have been very much guilty of that. And so we hear and we see here in scripture that a fool is full of words and that their mouth pours out foolishness. Why? Because, you know, the proverb says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So God, please fill our hearts with the abundance of all that you are. Lord, fill our hearts with the abundance of your love and the abundance of your wisdom. Amen. Now we're at point number three. The foolish are often angry and reckless. Yikes. Sadly, a fool is unreasonably quick to become angry. So let's see what the Bible says about this. 
Proverbs 18, verse 6, a fool's lips enter into arguments and his mouth calls for strokes. Proverbs 14, verse 17, who, he who is soon angry or quick tempered acts foolishly and a man of wicked, so I can't read, and a man of wicked plots is hatred. So let me read that again. Proverbs 14, verse 17 says, He who is soon angry acts foolishly, and a man of wicked plots is hated. Again, let's, let's read the scripture just above that. Proverbs 14, verse 16. A wise man fears and departs from evil, but the fool rages and is confident. And I think this word confident is synonymous to to arrogance when used in this context, right? And in Ecclesiastes, just to support the second general point that fools are unreasonably quick to become angry, Ecclesiastes um, chapter 7 verse 9 says, Do not be hasty in your spirit to become angry, for anger resides in the heart of Fools. Lord God, please let us not be quick to become angry, my God, but let us be filled with the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Second last general characteristic of, of foolishness. Number four, the foolish trust in their own heart. Proverbs chapter 12 verse 15 says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that listens unto counsel is wise. Thank you, Jesus. We want to be people who are teachable and who listen to counsel. Proverbs 14, 12, we unfolded this scripture when we were talking about the rich foolish man in Luke chapter 12, but we're going to read it again. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that seems right to a man but the end of it are the ways of death. You know, I, I recall the scripture where we are um, instructed that the heart is deceitful above all things and no one can know really the contents of our heart except for God alone. And, and, and I find it quite humorous you know, when I would hear in the past and even now casually in conversations um, commonly stated, you know, just just go with 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 what you feel. Um, just trust your heart. But then again, as Christians, I, I I reckon to counter that and to say, no, we we can't trust in our own heart, and we surely cannot lean on our own understanding, but let us acknowledge God in all of our ways because he will direct our path. And so we look and we trust in the word of God, in the person of Jesus Christ to be our guide. We don't trust in our heart because our very own emotions will fool us, our very own heart will deceive us, right? Um, but the Lord who searches the hearts and the minds, he alone is the one who truly knows um, our motives. And so we need to bring all of these things that are bothering us, that are of concern to us, even a desire. We need to submit that to the Lord to make sure that that this is of him. And if it isn't, Lord, take it away, remove that desire and replace it, my God, with the desire to follow you through and through. Because we know that God only desires the very best for us. Fifth and last, we talked about this in the beginning of Real Talk, our, our fundamental point here in Psalms 14 verse 1. The foolish say there is no God. Taken from scripture, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that does good. Can you imagine that? 
I know I've, I've shared in quite uh, length um, in the beginning of Real Talk how um, we ought to not step outside of the boundaries of being so bold in declaring, especially when we're going through a rough time and when we see what's happening around us in our world and our nation and our community, to even say there is no God because we are all made in the image and in the likeness of God. He is our master creator. He is the God of all of heaven and all of the earth. But my dear friends, we live in a fallen world. We live in a world that is contaminated. It has been infiltrated with all kinds of evil because the very people who live in it are not immortal. We are mortal beings. Yes, we have been created in the image and in the likeness of God. God has given us a mind, a, a, a body, a soul, a spirit, free will. Thank you, Jesus. We're not created as robots. But you can see the destruction that arises when people are led by their own directives and their own agenda. And when people whose hearts are filled without the fear of God start to affect the world and the people at large because of the abundance of evil residing in the heart of every human person. And so anyone who would openly say that there is no God, this didn't come out from my mouth, so please do not take offense to this. This is from the word of God. It says here that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Rather, when we see trouble, when we see distress, when we begin to question the sovereignty and the whereabouts of God in our challenge and in our difficulties, whatever measure of faith that you have on the inside of you, please let this be my encouragement to each and every one of you this evening, use that small measure of faith to say, God, I do not understand what is happening around me, what is happening to me. But as an act of my will, I choose to put my faith in you because I do not want to be a fool. I choose to believe in you. And that is our prayer, my dear friends, for all of our loved ones, that each and every person would come to know Jesus Christ and experience the saving grace of Jesus Christ by having a relationship with him. And so really quickly, I'm, I'm going to just itemize again the five general characteristics of foolishness as taken from the scripture. Number one, the foolish hate instruction. They hate wisdom. They hate, they hate instruction. They hate knowledge and they hate understanding. You know, Pastor Alice is, uh, all, I, I would say it's one of her favorite verses. I believe it's in Proverbs 12, 1, right? That a man who does not like correction is considered stupid. And yes, that is in the Bible. You can look it up. Second gener general characteristic of foolishness in the Bible is the foolish are full of words, right? They are so quick to speak, but they are not quick to listen. You know, when we are so quick with our words, it just paves way to pride, right? We need to, 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 to take a step back and we need to allow others to pour into our life and to teach us and to... To bring us to accountability too if what we are thinking and saying is actually correct and based on the word of god number three the foolish are often angry and reckless the bible the scriptures support this and you can go back um, to the stream to uncover the scriptures that we uh, talked about here that to act rashly right, is a sign of foolishness because the wise are able to hold back calmly their anger. Number four, the foolish, they trust in their own heart. 
We ought not to be people who are wise in our own understanding, who lean on our own understanding, no, but we ought to be people who acknowledge God in all of our ways because he will surely guide our path. You know, we may think that what we're thinking and doing most of the time is correct, but Proverbs 14, 12 clearly states that there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it are the ways of death. And so God, we, we need you to guide us. Number, number five, last but not least, a general characteristic of a fool taken from the Bible is the fool says that there is no God. Psalms 14 verse 1, they are corrupt. They have done abominable works and there is none that does good. We know that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he is the ultimate picture of goodness. And we know that apart from him, we are not righteous. The Bible says that even our own good works are as filthy rags before God. Is there hope for us? Absolutely. There is hope for us. And that is to continually walk in the spirit of God, to walk in the wisdom of God, and to be filled with the spirit of God so that we do not find ourselves demonstrating this characteristic of foolishness as described in the Bible. Thank you to so many of you that have stayed on the stream for this evening's Real Talk as we unfolded um, on a very general basis um, what the Bible says about foolishness. On behalf of um, Pastor Alice and Pastor Jim and our entire church family at Skyway, we want you to know that we are praying for you and that we love each and every one of you. And more importantly, there is a real love found in the person of Jesus Christ. He died for our sins and he paid the payment of our sins. One death, one sin equals one death. And so Jesus paid that price so that you and I would be given freedom, that we would be given eternal life. I really quickly want to um, just go back to that one point um, that I shared earlier on when we were talking about the second characteristic of the rich foolish man, and that is the importance of um, being driven with an eternal perspective, being driven by eternity. We see what's happening in the world right now, and Bible prophecy is unfolding before our very own eyes. And we are witnessing, our children are witnessing in their lifetime, very, very significant events, historical events that are symbolizing the birth pains that we have been forewarned about in the Bible. Now is not the time for us to continue to walk in a state of ignorance, arrogance, and foolishness. But the Bible compels us that every day that we are alive, today, that day, this day is the day of salvation because tomorrow is not guaranteed to any one of us. And so for those of you that are joining us right now on Real Talk and you have had, you know, questions and, and you've had thoughts about possibly pursuing a relationship with Jesus Christ, may I please encourage you not to think any longer or to doubt any further. Come to the cross. Come to the cross where you will find help, where you will find mercy, where you will experience the strength and the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. For those of you that would like to receive the Lord 
Jesus into your life. You can repeat this prayer of salvation with me right now. Dear God in heaven, I come before you today and I acknowledge my sin to you. I acknowledge that you paid the penalty for my sin by dying on the cross for me. I ask you to forgive me, to cleanse me, and to make me as white as snow. Today, I put my faith and my life and my trust into your hands. And I receive you, Lord Jesus, to be the master and the savior of my life. I do not want to continue to walk in foolishness and to think that my own way is the right way. I submit my body, my mind, my will, and my emotions to you. And I allow you to now lead me into a life of righteousness. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. And I believe that you were raised from the dead. Thank you for now giving me the gift of the person of the Holy Spirit who now dwells on the inside of me and who will lead me and guide me into all truth. Lord, I receive your love for me and my family today. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, welcome into the family of God. We, we continually encourage you to um, join us online. And if you are able to come join us for services on Sundays at 76 Crockford Boulevard, the home location of Skyway Christian Assembly. We would be so pleased to worship with you and to fellowship with you and to continue to disciple you. And that's at 10 o'clock every Sunday morning. We're going to close with, uh, with one more song. And this song is called Take My Life Holiness. And I pray that you will be blessed. Once again, this is Jasmine filling in for Pastor Alice on this evening's Real Talk. May the Lord bless you. Brokenness, brokenness 
this is what I long for. Brokenness is what I need. Brokenness, brokenness is what you want from me. So take my heart. Thank you. 